that they were a crock of crap. And then started looking into the government. And then in school when they were telling us stuff and it was like, well, wait a minute, that's not right. You know, I know uh, you can read a book and learn half his history isn't correct. And then they learned it was indoctrination and just started listening to people and uh, following conspiracy theories and finding out that most of the conspiracy theories are true. So, and then got into being press and that really wakes you up when you get behind the scenes on everything. Well, I read The Prince by Machiavelli mm. and kind of explains a lot of like the reasoning behind politics and, you know. <laughs> Sorry, can you speak up? Well, The Prince by Machiavelli is it's a political book and it's kind of like, it explains a lot about how modern government, government works and how you lie to gain power and so forth. And then uh, afterwards I just started reading other things like Common Sense. Uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Apple don't fall very far from the tree. <laughs> Liberal round. Yeah. <laughs> we have most of our people now. We have three of us, so we should be able to get you're, you're David, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Welcome to the For the Love of Freedom Richmond! you're in a library tonight doesn't mean you have to be shy. <laughs> We're going to have more fun in this library you've seen in a long time tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Now, uh, one of the things that we do all too often as libertarians when we get together, if I may presumptively, collectivistly apply that label to all of you, is that we tend to pat ourselves on the back and tell each other how right we are about everything. So tonight I want to talk about something a little more practical. And uh, so let me get this out of the way. Congratulations, you guys are right about everything. <laughs> Even those of you who disagree with the other ones of you about that thing that you're absolutely positive about, you guys are right about everything too. So, um, and it's nice to see that the movement is at least expanding a little out of our, uh, you know, core circle of white male INTJs who tonight thank you very much for crawling out of your basements and <laughs> parents' basements and not spamming for Ron Paul anymore. I really appreciate that. <laughs> but anytime we get people together like this, we want to make sure that we're forming the connections that strengthen the movement, not just coming together for a, a, an intellectual or, or ideological indulgence. So uh, I'm not going to say turn to the person to your left and shake their hand and turn to the person to your right and shake their hand. I'll just say, please make an effort to meet somebody new tonight and in, in so many ways uh, give people the encouragement to be better activists in a way that strengthens the movement. And uh, I will say before, before we bring our, our guest speakers up tonight in this vein that we want to introduce you to people who are doing work locally, who you should know, who you can get plugged in with. But uh, I'm, I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary of full time activism next February, almost ten full years of this, and I've seen a lot of people come and go, thank you, I've seen a lot of people come and go in the movement for uh, a variety of reasons, but, you know, burnout, personal circumstances, financial circumstances, you know, whatever it is that, that makes it hard for people to stick around and, and make, um, I don't think of it as a sacrifice, I think of it as, as, as a, a wiser long-term investment, sometimes short-term interests get in the way of making that long-term investment. But one of the things that really uh, encourages me is the kind of feedback that I get now uh, after 10 years, having made every mistake possible in the activist playbook, and now shifting my focus to how I share this message in a way that's empowering and helps people live better lives. And so now I'm at the point where I get emails at least once a day, messages across social media from someone saying, Adam, thank you for changing my life. Because of you, I did not enlist in the United States military. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> because of you, I did not become a police officer. Yeah. <laughs> because of you, I got so angry that I had to go out and grow my own vegetables. <laughs> 
And so if there's someone here tonight or someone in your life, maybe it's someone whose work you've read or videos you've watched or, or something else, uh, tell them. If someone has helped you become a better libertarian in, in, in however you want to define that, uh, if anybody has helped you become a better person, tell them, give them that feedback. Because that's what keeps us going as activists, that kind of appreciation. And uh, now that I've been at least uh, focused on winning converts rather than winning arguments, I've been getting a lot more of that. That's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But first, we have some great guest speakers tonight. First, Will Hammer. Will is the founder and CFO of Freedom Gulch, best known for his runs for U.S. House and Virginia House, which were historic bests for the Libertarian Party of Virginia. He's also the 2016 recipient of the Patrick Henry Award, awarded at this last Libertarian National Convention. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Hammer. All right, guys. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all are anarcho-capitalists or minarchists, but I imagine all of us are broad stroke libertarians, as Adam spoke. Um, and I just want to uh, talk about how um, I know a lot of people do not believe in the political process. Uh, myself, I went through a, process, uh, a stage where I didn't see that as very beneficial. But I came back around, and I did see that there is a benefit to uh, working in, within the political realm. Uh, myself, I went to college as a liberal, uh, raised as a Democrat, and went to college as a physics major. Um, decided not to do that, took a semester of classes, and took an economics class. And I was hooked after that. I was very blessed to go to a college with a lot of Austrians, uh, Anthony Carilli, Chris Coyne, and so I got hooked on that and became a libertarian. Um, of course, I started as a classical liberal and worked my way down the rabbit hole until I became a full-on voluntarist, anarcho-capitalist, uh, by 2011, 2012. Um, and I just want to point out that you know, a lot of people do not believe in the political process, like I said, but you need to realize that a lot of people come into the movement through the political process. And a lot of us, including me, with Ron Paul, 2007-2008, came into the libertarian uh, movement because of him. And so it has a double meaning where you can educate people, you can reach out to people, you can awake people to the libertarian principles. And then you bring them in, you educate them, and then they can keep on going down the so-called rabbit hole till they get to the point where it's the logical conclusion of voluntarism. But at the very least, we get more libertarians, more people that are liberty-minded, and we can grow that movement uh, whether it's political or whether it's through agorism and other means, uh, using Bitcoin, uh, using peer-to-peer -peer technology, Uber or Lyft, uh, you know, whatever you see fit that you can advance the movement, I recommend being active, whether it is using Uber and Lyft or Airbnb or Bitcoin or running for office or going out and petitioning for libertarian candidates. Just get active. Um, you know, people like Adam Kokesh, of course, have always uh, you know, brought a lot of people into the movement, as well as Ron Paul and other people. And so you never know who you're going to affect. Um, you know, when I ran uh, two years, uh, I had a lot of people message me that this is the first time they were voting libertarian, and that gets people into the, the mindset, and they actually started looking into libertarianism. And so don't dismiss political, uh, the political game. You know, think of it as one tool in your toolkit, the, the advanced liberty. And um, you know, don't necessarily make it your only tool, but that is one tool in the toolkit to further the cause. And you know, as Henry David Thoreau uh, would say, you know, live your life you imagined. And so just live a as you were that you wish to see the world be. You know, the stateless society or um, a, a, a smaller government society. You know, like I said, use those services and um, just help out each other and. Uh, Grow the movement as much as you can, whatever means uh, you believe is the best that you can do. So uh, that's all I'm going to have to say today. So I really appreciate it, and uh, uh, thank you, Adam. You know you're a very uh, you know big person to get me to the point where I am, and uh, I look forward to CoCash 2020. So excellent. You know, just to, to echo what he said specifically, it was really a powerful moment for me at the convention to hear Will Coley debate as someone who expressed remorse 
as a freedom activist to say that he had neglected the opportunity of political participation as a way of reaching groups that he wasn't able to otherwise, and to hear him speak so passionately about that at the at, at, at least uh, one of the vice presidential debates at the Libertarian Convention was it was a very big affirming moment for me, and, and uh, I would I would encourage everybody to to check that out if they get a chance. But uh, there are a lot of candidates now who are realizing exactly what Will said, and I'd like to think that I will soon be one of them. So uh, David Bucciarelli ran for city council in Colonial Heights last year. He is here to talk about how our government is a cancer and how my activism, if I, I got to, I, my name's in his introduction, so like I'm trying to avoid saying it incorrectly here. Um, but we also want to thank uh, David uh, on behalf of the volunteer team, especially our volunteer coordinator, Alyssa Walden, for David helping out with this event. So ladies and gentlemen, David Bucciarelli. How's everybody doing today? My name is David Butcherelli. I had ran for a city council last year in a special election. <laughs> yeah, it was the first time I've really done some public speaking, to be honest with you. I'm doing great. Thanks. <laughs> Keep going. Thanks. Um, I, I got involved in RAN because city council. Um, The city planners and stuff was trying to, code enforcement, I'm sorry, I had a complete brain fart. <laughs> All right, code enforcement was going around and nitpicking everything. So I got involved and started running. Well, kind of code really enforcing. It. it was trying to enforce codes, silly codes, like they wanted trash cans to be off the side of the street and there was nitpicking grass. Writing tickets. Yeah. Put on people's doors. Mm hmm And then one thing while I was running, I was going around and one of my big things was the blue light blue light law. On Saturday night after twelve o'clock, bars can't stay open in there. You can't sell alcohol. While running, I started talking about that to different people. This year I didn't run again. It's a normal election. But three of the other people running for the open seats were talking about that. And that's one thing that I remember watching a lot of stuff Adam said was once you hear something, you cannot unhear it. While we might run and not get elected at times, when you talk about stuff, people then hear it and they, they can't forget it. So once it's said, it's said. But when I got involved, I was libertarian, libertarian leader. Um, a guy named Carl Loser introduced me to Adam Kokesh's videos, and it just started leaning me more and more towards the volunteerist thought process. Thank you for all you've done and continue to do. I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I got. Finally, Joshua Wilcoxon is the political director of LP Virginia and a Richmond native here to talk about the strategy for the party here in the state in the immediate future. And of course, thank you to Josh for being instrumental in putting this event together as well. So we probably should have done this in the beginning, but I kind of just want to take the temperature in the room really quick. Like, uh, how many, has anybody here been following the? Uh, the federal election that we're going to have in a couple months. <laughs> oh, wow. Can you show your hands so I can see it? Okay, that's what you're going to do. You two are the same ones. Good, good for you. I'm glad you haven't been. Uh, so who here, uh, just so I know how to message correctly, I don't want to tell you things you already know, uh, who here considers themselves, quote, unquote, a voluntarist or anarchist or who believes that there should not be a state? Okay. Who, who believes that you know maybe there should be a, maybe there are minarchists maybe there should be that the minimal sort of necessary state in your mind. Uh, people, enough to keep it together. Yeah. Okay. You know, just so that way you're not running down the street, all Raider style, a la Fallout Four. You know. 
Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and um, you know, to be perfectly honest, Will talked about a lot of the things that I want to talk about, so I, we can we can make this really quick. But um, who, does anyone here find voting immoral? I'm not going to vote. Voting's violent. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Voting is immoral, but, whether you find it so or not. Okay, well, well, all right, well, I believe you. I mean, I believe that you believe that. Um, who, so, does it, who here votes? If you don't mind asking, who, who thinks that well, it's, it's okay to vote? It's good to vote. Or, okay. I, I try, but. It seems it just doesn't matter if I put my voice vote out there. The person I want ain't getting in. <laughs> yeah, people people are so like their, their, their vote to them is so sacred. Like they think they think that their vote is going to decide the election. So they're like, oh, we got to vote for him because he's the only one that can win. But I, I don't know the last major election that was actually won by by one vote. But um, um, so who who among here is interested? You know, I guess voting is one way to express ourselves. How many of you are interested in outreach and talking other people sort of in the way that you think? I'm um, trying to help us grow this movement. Is anybody interested in that in that type of activity? Okay, because because if, if you think about sort of um, if you think about the the, the public, the, the political spectrum as a funnel, oh, I, they didn't give us a marker, but uh, <laughs> but the, the top of the funnel is everybody, everyone, you know, all the liberals, the conservatives, the people who are non-political. And at the very bottom of the funnel, the small little bit of the funnel, that's that's this room. That's, well, there are a few more of us than, than this, but uh, this is representative of kind of what we have. There are not a whole lot of us right now. And, and I think if we want to get what we want politically or, or without, you know, without politics, either way, we need to bring more people to our, to, to our line of thinking. And um, I don't think that there's one way to do that. I think everyone, we argue with ourselves that this, this movement is so incestuous and critical of, of itself. I would like to see more moments like what happened a second ago. Like, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but. But Dave kind of like lost his train of thought for a second, and so Tyler said, you know, kind of like little on, hey, was it like this? Was it like that? I, I love that sort of like that nurturing. Like, I mean, we're we're a small group, and we need to build each other up and pick each other up, and not tell each other, you know, we're wrong all the time, because it, because we're not all in the same point of this funnel. Even in this room, even though of Adams fans, we're not all in the exact same space. So if we listen, if we talk to each other, if instead of trying to push a philosophy of you know, I read this book and that book, and so therefore you're wrong. But we try to let the people that we're talking to kind of drive a little bit of the problems that they have in their lives. And so we don't have to sort of sell them on this ideological consistency. But if we can just, we have the best answers. We have the right philosophy. So that philosophy should solve real world problems. And I think it does. And so if we can sort of let them lead with the problems they're having, we, I think we have the solution to those issues. And that hits harder and, and has greater impact than sort of trying to like, you know, convince, who in here is logically defeated somebody into admitting that they were wrong in one argument that way. If you honestly have, I'd love to see it. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, right, yeah, I mean, it's, okay. I mean, so, so you know, sometimes that works. Who, who here has tried that and had it not work? Even though you were right, you looked at the person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so, phrase it that way. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, it's whatever works, we have to try things. Three weeks ago, who would have guessed that we would be talking about a controversy about standing and uh, for the national anthem, and that that controversy would be spurred by a backup quarterback who makes 12 million bucks a year not standing up. It seems perfectly reasonable in retrospect. Oh yeah, everyone watches football. It makes perfect sense. But I don't think any of us would have predicted that. I don't think that, that this revolution that, that we're going to be a part of, I don't think we can know exactly how it's going to take place. I think we need to try different things and just kind of see, see what works and see who gets momentum. Different people will come over different ways. So, so kind of the main point of what I'm talking about is, is let's try to, to remember that that everybody's in a little different place on this imaginary funnel, and that um, hey, welcome, come in, guys. Hey, okay. and that um, and that if we let the other people, if we if we solve their problems, and we teach them at least how we can solve their problems, or, or you know address their issues, not not that it's going to be a perfect utopia, I think we can win more support than um, than by sort of you know this is my philosophy and this is why everything you believe is wrong and your parents are wrong kind of thing because people are resistant to that typically. If you can if you can do that consistently, you're going to be an amazing activist because the, the, I mean we, we would be bigger um, now than we are. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, real quickly um, what's going on here in Virginia right now. Everyone in the country is thinking about this this uh, November election, Hillary or Trump. Who's it going to be? No one really likes either one of them. Most people don't like either one of them. And most people think the world is going to end there because mostly because of the Supreme Court. And um, one of the reasons I appreciate people like Adam is that he thinks a little bit more strategically than that. There is going to be a tomorrow, and we can't make these decisions like we, like we get cornered into buying a, a used car or something. We have to think a little more strategically. No matter who wins in November, here in Virginia, at least half of the state is going to be pissed off. They're going to be not happy. 
Most people are not going to like either one of them. And I want you guys to think about one year from now. We have, we're electing 101 members of the House of Delegates next year. One, every, the whole House of Delegates is going to turn over. Last year, 70 of those 101 seats were unopposed. No one even ran against the, the incumbent or the, or the person running. 70% unopposed. Each district has, I want to say, 20 or 30,000 people, maybe more than that, <clears throat> maybe 70,000 people, maybe 30, I probably should have looked that one up before I got up here. But, um, but, but most of them have a participation of three to 4,000 people come out and vote. If we can use whatever technique is most comfortable with us, talking to the types of people that we most get along with and relate to, we can win seats in the House of Delegates next year. And then all over the country, all the libertarian activists, next time for 2020 and in 2018, when they say, oh yeah, well, what have you guys ever won? You know, you've never won anything. If we can win at least one seat in the House of Delegates, that would, that would just be so tremendous for this movement nationwide. And I, th I think we can do it. And um, I, want, I want us to you know, keep in touch. I'm going to put my cards on the table. Um, so you, got, you guys can shoot me an email if you want to talk about how to do this. We need candidates to run in the House of Delegates. We're looking for about 20 to 30. We, we want to try to, um, to, to get some opposition there. And, and I, I think with, with the, the tone of, of the nation, of the state, I, I th really think we have a chance to win a few. Now, let's say we do. Right now, it's about, it's about two-thirds Republican and we have a Democratic governor. And if we can win, you know, four, five seats in the House of Delegates, the veto-proof majority that the Republicans need to overturn one of McCullough's vetoes has to come through us. They have to come to us, and they have to involve it, involve us. So even with a small number of seats, we can have a huge impact on how this $80 billion transportation tax, you know, is, is spent. Um, how am I doing on time? Are, are you? Yeah. Um, so, um, so, so I, I really, I, I love, I love your help with that. If you want to run, if you want to help us run here in the Richmond area, we're gonna, we're kind of thinking about it like, a, like a statewide ticket, um, because we, we want people to know this is what we're doing. This is the first time I've, we've ever publicly talked about this. You know, um, so some of us have been kind of strategizing on it for for a while, but this is the first time we've talked about it. Um, how does that hit you guys? Does that sound? Is that crazy? Does that sound realistic? Does that seem like somewhat possible, plausible? Plausible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. County um, governments, man. What's that? County governments. Yeah, okay. So county governments, for at least for Henrico County, where I live, is 2017. That's the, uh, or 2018. That's the next year. So, you know, <laughs> heaven forbid we don't, you know, achieve what we're trying to do next year. We, we should, you know, run those as well. Absolutely. <coughs> um, so, so, and so let's talk about some non-political things. You know, we, we also, there's a group on Facebook called uh, Richmond Metropolitan Libertarians. We, uh, we, ha we have a, a monthly dinner that's the first Tuesday. It's Tuesday, right? The Patrick Henry Summer Club? Yeah, the first Tuesday, we have dinner at the Robin Inn uh, in the fan. Uh, we've been doing a monthly uh, on Brook Road up on North Side. Uh, we've been doing a monthly brunch on Saturday. But if you, if you will join that page, we're going to also start, for, for those of us who are over 21, we're going to start kind of like a monthly bar night. And the bar night's not going to be, you know, like real hardcore team black and yellow. It's just going to be people who might be open. To, they're kind of interested in freedom. We're just going to get some people by, get some of those people from the top of the funnel that they can start to associate having a good time and talking with interesting, intelligent people with our broader movement. And then we'll either slowly or quickly kind of start to move them down the funnel versus going up and saying, hey, five-year-olds should be able to buy heroin at the store. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to work in Richmond, Virginia, you know, I mean, leading with that. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave my card. Shoot me an email. Love to get you guys, you know, love for you to continue what you're doing. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And, um, and now I'd like to, um, I'll tell you a quick story about, about how I found out about Adam. So about four years ago, um, I found out about Adam like I meet all my friends now. I was arguing on Facebook. And, um, and, and I got an email, out of, I got a message out of the blue from my friend in London, who I hadn't talked to in years. And he sent me, a, all he did was send me a video. And it was a video of Adam. And I watched the video and I was like, wow, my friend is showing me how to, how to do this without being a complete jerk to everybody. Like how to, how to sort of live, how to live freedom and let people see how you live and show them that, that, that you're happy and you're liberated and, and you're not afraid. And I'm starting to plagiarize you a little bit, so stop your feet and don't get too much into it. But, um, but I want you to pay uh, attention. You just take a whole hour. It's cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not paying me enough, definitely. But, but I want you to pay attention when Adam talks to not only what he says, but how he conducts himself. And, and I, I think he, he is free, and I, and I think he does and, and, and have that, that, that love of, of the free life. And I think that you know, if we kind of start to maybe, with some people, if we emulate that a little bit, I think... Um, I, I think that could help with, with the outreach as well. So I'm going to leave my card out there. Um, the actual, the video, it didn't really help me. I'm still a jerk to people on Facebook. But uh, maybe, maybe you guys will have better luck. Which, do you remember which video? I don't remember. Or what was the context? I'm talking man on the street stuff? 
Yeah, uh, it was. Well, it was you. Yeah, it was you talking. It was like sort of more of like that. That um, hens filled is it kind of investigative, asking Surprise questions. Surprise dialogue. Yeah, right. exactly. Versus kind of telling people what was right. And uh, it makes a lot of sense. You know, it's a struggle. It's it's every day. We have to kind of remind ourselves not to get angry and, and to sort of you know involve people. But uh, but with that, I'd, I'd love to introduce Adam Kokesh. Welcome into Richmond, and I hope hope you guys enjoy. Thank you very much. Adam. Well, you know, after, after what you said there, Josh, I, I kind of want to start with something that uh, I, I don't normally start with. Uh, people, when they introduce me, tend to be way too kind. So I usually have to issue corrections. <laughs> uh, I, and I, I'm really glad you said what you did about that at least I'm trying to be an example in that sense of, of living more free. But it's a discipline. You know, it, it's like, you know, being Zen and perfectly self-centered, living by the values of freedom, freedom, living in, to, to your potential and respect for your own will that way. And it's, it, it's part of what's in the book about emotional freedom. And, and especially after, uh, you know, what, what I've been going through in my personal life recently, I can't claim that. And I think it's, it's, it's really important, too, that, that while we, that, that while it's a significant part of what I do is try to show people how, how the message has made my life better, how it's made me happier and more free, I can't say that it's the silver bullet. You know, that, that living free, like living well, like living ethically, like living mindfully and conscientiously is an ongoing discipline. But thank you for at least giving me credit for, for being in the right direction, but I cannot take credit for, for having achieved any kind of destination because th there isn't really one well, that's in, in that the regard. Rest so, all right, so. How many of you consider yourselves to be awake? <laughs> oh no, this time, now we got almost every hand, huh? What a bunch of collectivist conformists you are. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you've all got tattoos, two really trendy ones. No. I hope you guys don't mind. No, no. See, yeah, that's the rebellious thing now, is to be like, no, I don't have tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't mind, I have no 